Richt. My name is David Peterson, and this is The Art of Language Invention. Episode 9, The Old Dead Consonant Trick. A lot of times if you're working on a naturalistic conlang, one that's uh, evolved from a proto-language, you get an idea that you want to introduce a new phoneme set, and like an easy way to do that is to, for example, lanite some consonants to produce a series of new consonants, or at least that's what it seems. So like, say that you had some sort of a simple phoneme inventory, like you had, you know, your three basic voiceless stops, your three basic voice stops, maybe an S, maybe an H, and probably some other stuff, but we're going to focus on the stops right now. Uh, one thing you could do, let's say that if you wanted a series of voiced stops, is to say, well, all right, we'll just take all of the, uh, I'm sorry, a series of voiced fricatives. You could take the voiced stops and then lanite them in between vowels. And so you take your B and you get some kind of a V, you get your D and get like an ETH or something, and you, t and you take your G and produce a voiced velar fricative R. Um, and that's great, but um, you haven't actually really produced new phonemes. Uh, you just produced different ways of pronouncing those same phonemes. Uh, and so you think, well, okay, that's, I mean, because after all, you only have the fricatives in between vowels and you only have the stops at the beginning of words. But you say, oh, well, I'll well, well, we'll fix that a little bit. We'll just voice the voiceless consonants in between vowels. So you take all your voiceless stops um, and you voice them in between vowels. And then now you have, for example, B at the beginning of a word and B in between vowels. Um, but... Uh, then, of course, now you don't have the voiceless stops in between vowels. So what do you do? Let me introduce you to what I call the old dead consonant trick. Uh, it's pretty simple, and all you need is a proto-language and willingness to mess with its phonology. Uh, here's how it works. Step one, you introduce a parallel series of consonants that are somehow, uh, for lack of a better word, stronger than the other ones. So this could be a series of glottalic consonants, uh, so uh, ejectives and implosives. It could be a series of pharyngealized consonants. It could be a series of velarized consonants. It can be uh, geminates. It can be prenasalized consonants. Uh, whatever you want, just so long as for every consonant that you want to have a duplicate for, keep that in mind, you have uh, basically one from the parallel series. So if you want to preserve voiceless stops, then you have a series of voiceless stops that are stronger, you know, fortified. Uh, same with voice stops. All right, that's step one. Step two, you lanite the weak consonants. Whether this is turning uh, voiced stops into fricatives in between vowels, or voiceless stops, uh, just voicing them in between vowels. Whatever you're going to do, you do that lenition first. So it's happened. The next step is you destroy your strong consonants. Um, very, very easy thing to do. You basically just say across the board, all right, these things just stop being pronounced this way. So you lose your ejectives, uh, you lose your implosives. They're now just uh, pronounced like regular weak consonants. Uh, so that's uh, step three. Step four, I mean, that's it, you're done. All right, so what you've done is you have now, let's say, uh, you have, uh, focusing on the voice stops, you now have voice stops at the beginning of word, and you also have voice stops in between vowels because those used to be the strong consonants. But of course, since that distinction has been lost throughout the years, basically it looks like you have a new phoneme. You have one that occurs everywhere, and you have another one that occurs only between vowels. And of course, if you want it at the beginning of a word, you could do one of two things. One, you could say that, for example, uh, the weak consonants lanite before vowels, that would include at the beginning of a word, um, or after vowels, and that would give you at the end of a word. Uh, or you could just have uh, a consonant at the beginning that drops off. Say that you have um, some sort of a, I don't know, a schwa or something. And so that you have like a schwa, b, vowel, the rest of the word. Um, there's the lenition that happens. Then you lose the schwa at the beginning of the word. Very simple. Yeah, you can do that whenever you want. All right. The result of this should be at least one new phoneme. That is, you should at least have one stable phoneme and another one that has a limited distribution. But again, you know, you can fix that uh, with other tricks, basically, to increase the distribution. 
Um, I've used this trick a lot, uh, not just phonologically, but also to produce what I call C glyphs. That is, you know, C like that. I hope, I hope that came out right. I think it did. Um, anyway, uh, C glyph is like, if you think about the letter C in English, it's one of those consonants that's sometimes pronounced like S, sometimes pronounced like K, as opposed to a K, which is always pronounced the same way for the most part. Um, C glyphs are very hard to produce, but you can produce them very easily with this dead consonant trick. So uh, I did this with cast thin, uh, where there's an entire series of basically old strong consonants and old weak consonants. Uh, the strong consonants were leveled, uh, but it was at the uh, strong and weak consonant stage that the writing system was created. Um, with a conservative orthography then, uh, move that forward a few centuries, suddenly you have two sets of consonants, a whole bunch of C glyphs and a whole bunch of strong glyphs. So for example, you have your two S glyphs that look like this. The strong S glyph is always pronounced S no matter where it is. The weak S glyph though uh, shows up as S, but it also uh, shows up as SH, it shows up as Z, it shows up as uh, Z, um, and I, I think that's it. Uh, in a variety of different distributions, depending on what its phonological history was. Um, anyway, it's a nice, neat little trick that you can just drop in if, for whatever reason, you cannot get the sounds where you want them to be based on your phonological rules. That's it for this episode. For those who have followed this series to the extent that it's been a series, you'll know that I took a long hiatus due to the birth of my child. Uh, I thought I would be able to kind of get back to recording videos around February, but it is now April 1st, which is pretty funny, given what April 1st is. Anyway, uh, I anticipated certain things about having a child, and I was right about a lot of them. I was wrong about how quickly I could get back to simply having a lot of time to do things like this. Uh, specifically, it's been hard to just find time to record in a quiet space for whatever reason. Um, I hope I have hit on a solution. I used to record during the day when my wife was at work. I'm now recording late at, light, late at night. It's 1.30 a.m. I hope the lighting works. I hope I don't look like I'm really tired despite the fact that I am really tired. Uh, but um, this is my temporary solution for the time being. We'll see if I come up with a better one as things go on. I have a feeling that a year from now things will be a lot easier. We will see. Anyway, for the time being, I'm going to try to record at night and see if I can get back to a more or less regular schedule. But, you know, if you don't see a video every week, uh, bear with me. I'll try to get them up at least every two weeks with the aim of eventually getting back to one a week. Anyway, as usual, if you have a question you want me to answer on the show, leave a note in the comments or send an email to djpquery at gmail.com. Uh, if you want to see more videos like this one, feel free to subscribe. Thanks for watching.